Um, so um, today I'm wearing my other hat, so to speak, as you saw last week. And as I explained, I mean, most of my research life has been spent working on the clouds and uh, convection, both in high resolution models and also in, in terms of uh, the parameterization of those processes in, in climate models of, such as ECAM. And, of course, in the IFS at ESMWF that you've been accessing um, under S2S. Um, but in, in the nice thing about ICDP is that you have um, really a, a nice, should we say, freedom to look at the application side of things. And that was something I really wanted to get into at ICDP, to look at how one can translate forecast information into a, a, a usable end product in different sectors. And I was involved in two European projects, which are... Um, I've put the, 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 the um, how do you say, the emblem up here. So one was Healthy Futures, which was based in East Africa. That finished last year at the end of 2014. And Queasy, which was quantifying the effects of weather and climate on health uh, in uh, developing countries. That, that finished in 2013. And again, that was Africa-focused. So I've got a number of uh, co-authors here that have provided data or... Uh, Philippa was uh, working with me closely on the data analysis. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about this system. But to remind you, I'm not a biologist, so I, I don't have a 20-year a experience of all the biology. Okay, But I will do my best if you have questions on that side as well. Okay, So I've got a few slides to start off with to give you a little bit of background about the, the disease of malaria, uh, because probably a lot of you are like I was just three years ago, not knowing anything about the disease. And I was involved in this project on the modeling the effects of climate and health. So I thought, well, I better read up a little bit about the diseases and how they're modeled. And that's how I, I kind of stumbled into this, this modeling project by accident. It almost, uh, one of my, so Andy always says, crazy Christmas projects. <laughs> so in the end, uh, there was no open source model in which I could try out my own ideas. And so... Andy Moss, who was one of my, you know, friend and colleague, goaded me into basically writing my own model, uh, which I did. Uh, so this is what I basically want to introduce to you today and, and what we've actually done in this project. So malaria is actually caused by a parasite. There are actually six, I mean, you often see four species, but now one of the species, they actually think there's actually two separate species. Uh, that's still a little bit controversial. Uh, there are actually four main ones that generally uh, are found to infect man. The two principal ones are Thilsipidum and Vivax. Okay? But you also find in restricted locations around the world cases of these two species, malaria and ovale. Okay? Now, the most dangerous one is Thilsipidum. That's the one that's most commonly found as well in, in Africa. So that's the one that causes uh, the majority of mortality. Vivax uh, is less dangerous. There's a whole interesting background of why they think that is, about the ages, how long we've lived with these various species of, of parasites. But I don't have time to go into that today, but that's a coffee time conversation I, I actually find very interesting. Vivax is the one that can lie dormant. So even if you treat it, you feel fine, it can pop up again a year or two years later. That doesn't happen for Cyprum. It doesn't have the dormant stage. So for Cyprum is the dangerous one. Vivax is the one that's more difficult to clear. If you look at a map, we talk about malaria endemicity. So endemicity, we're talking about basically the, the level of transmission, how intense the transmission is, what proportion of the population you would expect to have the parasite. You can see that these days, the colors are not reproducing terribly well here, but it's essentially restricted to the tropics, and especially in Africa. So we have these, should we say, grades of endemicities going from hollow endemic where you basically have all year round intense transmission down to hyper endemic or you can refer to this as epidemic where maybe climate restricts the disease to occurring perhaps only every four, five, six years. So you won't have transmission every year. And of course this is important because it means that uh, you know, we have the capability to build up immunity to malaria but it takes quite a long time in these exposure. Immunity is not fully understood yet. Okay? But essentially, if you survive until your third, fourth, fifth birthday and you're living in, a, in an endemic area, then you build up immunity. So in these strongly endemic areas, it's children that are most at risk and pregnant women. 
Whereas in epidemic areas, then you have the whole section of population that can be at risk because basically between epidemic outbreaks, the population will lose their immunity to the disease. And so you have a wider risk profile. So the transmission fringes are probably the areas you want to focus on if you want to look at how climate variability is going to be controlling the outbreaks of the disease, where you might have potential information from a forecast system. I'm going to come on to the climate drivers in a moment. But essentially, if you look at a map of Africa, zooming into Africa, you see that basically these are the fringe areas where transmission can be irregular. So you can see there's a band across the Sahel that's pretty much affected by the extent of the monsoon. So variability in how far the monsoon stretches north will control year-to-year -year variability in transmission. So it's the fringe of the rains. Whereas these areas in eastern and southern Africa, as you can see, basically coincide with the topography, high areas where temperatures are colder and you're near the fringe of the temperature that can support transmission. So if it's slightly warmer than usual, you can go above the threshold in which transmission can be sustained. Okay. So these are the areas we're going to tend to, to focus on. A little bit more background again. This is the World Malaria Report from 2014. And again, it's just to emphasize why, for example, in these projects we were focusing on the continent of Africa. But of course, some of the work is relevant for other continents. And I'm trying to build up a project now, for example, in Brazil with colleagues there. Annual mortality um, is estimated now for the most recent year of around half a million. Okay, well, that's quite a drop. Some of that as well is, is due to improved diagnostics. I'm going to talk about that. So it's, some of it's not a real drop, but a lot of it is due to the, the, the scale-up of interventions. So, for example, now it's estimated that in Africa about 49% of the population has at least one bed net. Um, and, and these are the figures here at the bottom I want to emphasize. I mean, global spending in 2013 was now almost $3 billion. It's quite a lot of money. You want to make sure you, you target that money effectively. I'm going to come back to that theme. It's still below the targeted spending. The estimated amount that's needed to really get on top of the problem is almost double the, the actual figure that's available. Okay. So I've got a couple of figures now that will explain a little bit about the background of how climate actually affects the transmission of the disease before I go on to the modeling. Before I do that, um, one of the parameters that I'll be using as a model output to describe the intensity of transmission is basically the entomological inoculation rate. Okay? That's simply the number of bites that you receive per unit time that are actually from an infective mosquito. So you can imagine that if you get 10 bites in a day from an infective mos mosquito, your chances of having, uh, acquiring an infection are much higher than if you only receive one infective bite per month, obviously. So it's just basically a, a, a measure of the force of infection, how many infective bites you get per unit time. And so just as a back of the envelope rough, rough estimate, an, uh, an EIR value of around 10 per year, okay, so that's 10 infective bites per year, roughly marks the division between an epidemic area and an endemic area such as a meso endemic area where you have regular transmission but just for a short season, okay? In, in very hollow endemic areas, for example, where you have, you know, you're getting towards that year-round transmission, then you can get numbers as high as 500 or even 1,000, okay? So I think in Cameroon is, is the highest that they've measured. They, they had estimates of around 3,000 infective bites per year, so it's an average of 10 per day, okay? Just to give you an idea of the range. Very roughly, very, very roughly, the log of the EIR translates into clinical cases. Okay, that's a rough. I should have put a slide in to show that. So what are the climate drivers of malaria? Just to give you a background of the linkage. Well, there are a number of ways in which climate affects malaria, okay, through a number of parameters. Basically, the key ones are temperature and rainfall, but wind and relative humidity also will affect the transmission. So wind, how, how would you think... I was always asking you questions last week, so let's start again. Now, how would wind affect transmission, for example? Any ideas? Okay. 
Exactly. So they, they perhaps if it gets too strong, they, they might try and shelter. They can get evicted. You might you have cases where they have had not not malaria, but uh, you have cases of disease outbreaks sometimes in North Australia where insects have been blown across from Papua New Guinea uh, when they have strong uh, winds. Uh, insects do use winds though to track CO2. If the wind gets too turbulent and too strong, it's very difficult for them to track you. In fact, I find uh, here in the summer because we have a lot of insects here that. One of the best ways, if you don't want to use a net when it's hot, is just to put a fan on. It just disperses your CO2. They're amazing the way they track a little bit of side, should we say, information in brackets. So they, they basically sense our pheromones, uh, essentially mainly, mainly from the, the ankles. So if you have smelly feet, you're very attractive. So that's how they identify you. A lot of these uh, I'll talk about in a moment. There are some mosquitoes that are particularly dangerous for malaria because they like to bite people. So you can have... 100 cows in one person, but they will know where the person is because of the pheromone signal. They can sense perturbations to CO2 that are a fraction of a percent above background and follow the plume. So often people think about wind. They say, oh, it blows the insects downstream, but it's actually the opposite. They follow the wind upstream to actually find you because they, they receive the signal. So somebody in the quanti uh, quantitative life uh, sciences group, the biology group, they're actually looking at ways insects track. Okay, um, but the key variables are rainfall and temperature. So I should move on before I get too slow here. So rainfall, of course, is absolutely critical because a lot of the main species there are there are over fifty types of the Anopheles mosquito that can transmit malaria, but there are two or three key ones that are very important because they are the ones that really like to bite people. Okay, so they're basically anthropophilic. Rather than some insects are zoophilic, they prefer animals rather than people, and some just don't care. They're not fussy eaters. They just take what they can find. And those, like, like Anopheles gambiae, for example, likes to lay its eggs in small, clear, sunlit, temporary pools. So rainy season starts. You start to get ponding and puddling. We're talking about ponds on the scale of maybe 1, 5, 10 meters. If the ponds get too big, you have ripples that drown the larvae. Okay, So they don't like big lake bodies. You also have predators if the lake, if the, the water body is around for too long. So they they like they're they're basically insects of opportunity. Small, clear puddles, sunlit in most cases, except in high temperatures. So I'll show you in a moment how transmission in a lot of areas, if you don't have uh, a permanent water body or a hot spot, because you can get ponding around a lake, it's very complicated the hydrology in fact. Uh, that mostly the transmission season follows the rainfall season, but with a lag. Okay? Temperature has a multitude of impacts. Okay? I'm going to talk about some of those. The principle is, so here we have a schematic of the transmission cycle. So when a mosquito emerges from the larvae stage into the adult stage, they don't have the parasite. It can't be passed through the egg stage. So a newborn mosquito never has malaria. Okay? The female needs to take a blood meal in order to have the protein to develop her eggs. So after mating, she will look for a blood meal. Okay? If that blood meal just so happens to be taken from a person that has the parasites, she can acquire basically the disease, the parasites. There's a development stage inside the mosquito. Okay? That takes time. That time is a function of temperature. So the, mosquito, the parasite development inside the mosquito occurs faster if the temperatures are warmer. Then at some point, when that process is complete, sporozoites will basically be in the saliva glands of that female mosquito. If she then takes another meal after she lays her eggs, she then will basically take another meal to develop the next batch of eggs. She can then pass on the parasite to a second uninfected human. Okay. Temperature sensitivities. Well, I've already told you one, the parasite development. Okay. Two, the egg development inside the mosquito is faster at warmer temperatures. If it gets too hot, the mosquitoes die more quickly. So their lifespan is a function of temperature. So if it's very hot, they don't live very long. If they don't live very long, there's not much chance of them biting a second person. The egg development rate is also a function of the pond's temperature. The larvae mortality rate is also a function of pond temperature. Too hot, they die more quickly. And uh, I learned quite recently that also the fecundity, basically the number of eggs, is also 
are weaker, but it's a function of temperature as well. So the actual the number of eggs that the mosquito lays. How long could the eggs survive without, so, without water? Without water, uh, basically they dry. They don't. They don't have. So some of the species of Aedes that basically are important for Rift Valley fever transmission, they can sit kind of dormant in dry conditions for a long period, even years. Okay. But this is not the case for most of the Anopheles. So if the pond dries out, the larvae die, and that's the end of it. So if you get, we talked about sub-seasonal variability in rains, okay. It's, and then we gave the example of agriculture, two seasons with the same rainfall, one with sporadic rain, intense. For malaria transmission, that's bad. Obviously for us, it's good. If you have just small amounts of rain all the time, you expect to have much more transmission because the ponds don't dry out in the dry periods. And there's also, I don't want to go into too much detail, but if you have intense rain, it tends to flush out the sites. So what happens is the, the, the ponds, you have overflow, and the small larvae, especially the stage one larvae, basically just get flushed out onto the ground, and then they just dry, desiccate, and, and they die. Okay, so desiccation is, uh, is an issue. That's why you see sometimes, even in very small ponds, uh, larvae as well, but those uh, larvae often don't survive because those, those very small uh, ponds won't survive long enough, they will dry out. Only if they're in a, a larger scale depression where they, they keep water during the rainy season. Um, okay. So uh, basically, uh, that's just reiterating, as I said, the, the water stage temperature sensitivities, but I'll, I'll swiftly move on. This is just basically showing, I'm not going to go through all the detail of, of the actual development stage, but it's just go, showing the cycle. The thing I wanted to just emphasize in this slide, the reason why I include it, is when you get bitten by an infective mosquito, it's not 100% sure that you will actually acquire the parasite. It's actually quite difficult, this transmission process. So the probability of acquiring the disease is on the order of about 20 to 30%. It seems, but again, data is quite sparse, it seems that if you're have high immunity, there's also even a kind of blocking immunity that your body is able, when you get the first inoculation, to actually combat it straight away so it doesn't actually lead to a clinical case, you don't have the, the manifestation. So it seems when you have high immunity, that percentage drops even lower. That's quite important. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. That makes the, the, the transmission statistics, should we say, they're quite nonlinear. It's the same for the mosquito. When it bites you and you're, you basically have the disease, Again, it's on the order of 10 to 20 percent the chance of transmitting it to the mosquito. So there's, there, are, there are quite a lot of loopholes that the disease has to basically pass through. Okay. And I've put the thresholds here. So the threshold for the parasites is on the order of 16 to 18 degrees, and it's species dependent. So Falciparum, for example, the threshold is on the order of 18 degrees. Vivax, it's lower on the order of 16 degrees. That's why when there used to be malaria at higher latitudes, the malaria transmission in Europe was normally vivax. Falciparum only got as far north as Sicily, for example. So in the north of Italy, it was mainly vivax. But in the south of Italy, you had transmission of both vivax and falciparum because the temperatures were high enough to sustain. So those, those temperature sensitivities are basically species dependent. So to give you an example, I'm just going to take two of those temperature effects. Okay, just two of them and show you how they combine to give you a, a, a transmission curve as a function of temperature. So on the left-hand side here, this is basically showing on the x-axis we have temperature ranging from 16 to 40. And this is basically how long the parasite development cycle takes as a function of temperature. So you can see as up near the threshold, 200 days. Well, there are not many females that last that long. Most of them die much, much, much more quickly than that, you know, on the order of one or two months. <clears throat> But as you get above 28, you can see we're down to on the order of, of the range of around you know, five, six, seven days. Okay. And again, this is a, a kind of a, a generic curve. I think this is for falciparum, actually. I, I should have checked actually which one. I think this is falciparum. But if you basically, no, sorry, this is vivax because it's going below 18 here. So this will be slightly different for vivax and falciparum. Okay. On the right-hand side, we see basically temperature again, and this is the survival rate. So you can see that the curve is, around, is roughly flat at 90% daily survival rate. 
until you reach the mid-30s, where it drops off rapidly. Okay. So if you combine these two, this basically shows you a population of mosquitoes that live long enough in order for the parasite to complete its development cycle so they can pass it on to a second human. You can see at the left-hand side, it's basically zero because it's too cold. The parasites are just not developing fast enough. On the right-hand side, it, it drops to zero because even though the parasite is developing quickly, the mosquitoes are dying even faster. Okay. So you get this basically this sweet spot, so to speak, where you have this maximum on the order of 27 to 34. Okay. But this is just two effects. Once you add in the water temperature sensitivity, it starts to shift this curve to the left. Uh, so this is just, as I said, highlighting two of these effects. This is showing you the relationship. This is for a, a village in uh, southwest Niger. It's from a paper by Bombelis et al. The blue line is showing the seasonal cycle of the, the precipitation in this particular location. And the dashed lines are, are showing malaria cases for each line is a separate year, okay, if I remember rightly, 2001, 2002, 2003. And I think this was the, the mean rainfall for those three years. And you can see how transmission ramps up following the rainfall season, but with a delay, okay. So why do we have that delay? Because you have these cycles that have to be completed. It's like a, a process that has to spin up. When the rains start, first of all, you start to have the, the mosquitoes breeding, building up their numbers. Then you have to have, the, you've got the development cycle of the parasites. They've got to pass it on to a second person. So the whole system has to spin up. What is this delay a function of? Temperature. So the warmer it is, the faster the system can spin up and the smaller that delay is. So that delay is also a function of temperature. Okay. So fighting malaria, well, there's, there's a whole host, and, and this, is, this list is not complete, uh, I'm sure, of methodologies in which you can combat, combat uh, malaria. So you can distribute nets. People sleep under nets to protect them from being bitten. Those nets can be treated, so mosquitoes will basically die if they come into contact with the net. You can basically uh, residual spray people's housings uh, with insecticide. There's improved diagnostics. Uh, you, I mean, you have a whole thing of improved drug access. There are the ones on the right are, are tend to be more long-term interventions: housing improvements, health care, land management. And it's quite interesting. Again, you can give a whole lecture on how our approach to malaria has changed over the last hundred years. It's gone through phases. If you go back to the 1930s, the emphasis was on land management, drainage schemes. Okay. A lot more of this kind of infrastructure approaches. Then uh, suddenly we invented DDT. Uh, so in the 60s, there was this big move to towards eradicating malaria. It became much more attack in the vector, spraying breeding sites and so on. That failed. It, it, basically, 1970, the whole program was, was wound back. There was a big rebound. Now, basically, the key, these are why these, these two are in red, the key way the money is spent is through bed net distribution, okay, and residual spraying. And it's still, I mean, I'm not an expert on policy, but you really see that there's a disconnect between the, the long term and the early. There's, there's not always a, a long term. I remember when I was talking in Uganda about, you know, is, is there any emphasis on housing improvements? And, you know, they're basically, they, they said, well, no, why, 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 why would we do that? And, and it's, it's, there's definitely, the policy is a, there's a, there's a top-down approach from the WHO where they advise how to tackle the disease. And, and yet there have been studies that show a bed net costs $7, but for $20, you can put screening on a house. It lasts longer on the order of like 8 to 10 years, and, and it can be cost-effective. Okay. So we're, we're not using all of the weapons. It's a little bit like having a football team, and you only send three players on the field in some ways. I'm not saying bed nets are not effective, but um, I personally, personal opinion, this is not the opinion of ICDP, please. <laughs> you know, it, it seems that, uh, and, I, and again, I'm not an expert in this at all, but it does seem that we're not using our whole uh, arsenal of, of weapons against the disease. This gives you an idea of how things have turned around since the turn of the millennium, millennium okay, where one of the, the big goals was to tackle this disease. And you can see how bed net coverage has ramped up, and you have to class this as a, as a massive success. The penetration 
of bed net distribution. Uh, most countries in Africa now are, are massively increasing the, the, the coverage of, of bed nets through distribution working closely together with the Global Fund, the President's Malaria Initiative, and so on, um, through the Ministries of Health. I'm going to skip over that one. I'm running a little bit late. So modeling malaria, how, how would we want to actually model malaria? Well, the key thing you see with application models is they, unlike, we talk about diversity between climate models and so on, but underlying the climate models is essentially those same set of equations. You have the equations of momentum, you have your thermodynamic equation and so on. The differences come down into how you solve the numerics of the advection, how you basically parameterize all those subgrid scale processes, as we emphasized last week when the model uncertainty. But the situation is different when it comes to application models. You have a much wider array of modeling approaches. So as we saw, we have the statistical kind of approaches. You can use CPT to relate predictive variables to malaria cases. Okay. So you have models which are basically statistical models, which can be quite complicated, that, that incorporate, for example, data as well. So the map analysis at Oxford is a basically a, a Bayesian approach. You can, you can think of it as a, a, a kind of statistical, simple model, uh, like a data assimilation that incorporates um, surveys to give you an estimate of the, of the intensity of transmission. Okay. You have box model approaches, which I'm going to talk about next, which basically focus on the disease transmission in humans, okay, but are not incorporated in the climate. And then you have a number of dynamical models that try and represent the processes of transmission through basically dynamical equations that you integrate forward into time. Okay. There are not that many. There are more than I have listed here. I'm just listing some of the key ones. One of the ones is the, the Liverpool malaria model. Okay. That's a spatially distributed grid point model that tries to account for the rainfall and uh, temperature drivers of the disease. It doesn't account for population. So each grid point has 100 generic people in. So it doesn't account for changes in transmission as a function of population. Open malaria is basically um, the, the model that's uh, developed at the University of Basel. Uh, that was with uh, Gates. Uh, funding, actually. It's very successful in terms of the way it models intervention. So they're really focused on, you model a point location, but they're really trying to represent how bed nets, spraying, uh, drug distribution, and so on, affect that transmission. Again, it focuses on the human. So there is, there is no climate in, in this model. Okay. So they're basically, and this, and this is the only other open source model I'm aware of, all of the other dynamical modeling systems, basically, you, you can't access the source code. So I, I was motivated uh, in these projects to, I wanted to actually try out, should we say, some ideas I had about the population density interactions. Uh, and I found there was no model that basically accounted for climate, which was open source. Okay, so uh, I wrote my in. Before I do that, actually, uh, sorry, I did want to, I put this slide back in just to show you that a lot of the modeling approaches have what's called uh, an SEI or an SEIR approach, where essentially you have four compartments where people, if they're uninfected, they're susceptible, S, and you basically have a, a rate of change between these boxes where if you have a, a certain biting rate, you'll have a certain rate of moving people from the S box to the E box. Then they have a development time scale around 18 to 20 days, and so you have a rate of change from basically uh, exposed into infected. And if you have a, a, tr a representation of immunity, then uh, some people, after having a, a clinical manifestation, will be moved into the recovery box, whereas some won't develop immunity and will be just basically moved back into susceptibles. Okay. So there's a, a very nice review paper, if anyone's interested in this approach, that really summarizes all of the SEI models that have basically been put together over the last 10 years or so. I've forgotten to list it here, sorry. So I wanted to basically develop a model that accounted for temperature and rainfall impacts on the disease. I was interested in interannual variability, the predictability of the disease. But I wanted to improve also the representation of the surface hydrology, because the Liverpool model basically just 
has a linear relationship or that, you, that has been modified, but they just basically directly relate rainfall to eggs vector density. So I wanted to improve the surface hydrology, account for population density, uh, and be able to go down to resolutions on the order of 5 to 10 kilometers in terms of my grid box size. If you go finer than that, once you get down to a kilometer, then you have to start worrying about vectors moving from one box to another. Um, and I didn't really want to worry in the first instance about vector motions. Okay, so this is vector in a nutshell. I'm going to show a couple of other slides, but this just gives you an overview. So it's a dynamical model. I'm going to explain this graph in a second, but it accounts for the temperature effects on those key aspects of the disease transmission. It's got a, a, a simple pond parameterization, so I'll explain that in a second. But essentially, in a nutshell, I was working for a long time on, for example, cloud cover parameterizations. We talked about parameterizations last week where if something is occurring on a scale that's smaller than the grid box, you can't explicitly model it. So if you have a climate model with 100 kilometer boxes, you can't model each individual cloud. So you try and model the low order statistics of those clouds. So one, for example, aspect would be the cloud cover. How much of the box is covered by the clouds? And that can change in time. So you try and model it. You, know, you perhaps have a prognostic equation that influences that cloud cover. So what I did is I just turned that upside down. I have a pond parameterization. I can't model explicitly these five meter scale ponds. But what I want to model is how, in a statistical sense, the coverage of these breeding sites changes in response to rainfall in a simple way. Okay. And on the left, the model has population density. The population in this version is static. The people are not moving around. But we do have population density, which allows the model to represent to zero order how this is population density increasing. This is the biting rate. Okay. And basically, the blue is a collection from reviews of many papers of how the bite rate drops as the population density increases. And the red lines are different ensemble model simulations with the model in East Africa and West Africa. It shows you, you get this zero order effect of the population increases, decreasing transmission intensity. Now, of course, there are a whole host of other reasons why population density increases also impact malaria. You have better access to medical care inside cities, better drainage, less breeding sites possibly. So, so the background of the model is it simply tries to resolve these effects because I'm interested in predictability on seasonal timescales. So I want to get that delay as best as I can. So you have, for example, an array of boxes. So you have uh, an adult. She lays eggs. So I just simply model the progression of the eggs forward in time. When they reach the end box, they basically hatch into an adult. She looks for a blood meal. And then the eggs, I model the way the eggs are developing. It's gone a trophic cycle. So this is that egg adult, should we say, progression, okay? So how, do rain, how does rain actually affect this? Well, rains drives my pond coverage parameterization scheme. That basically gives me a, a, pond, a breeding site availability that relates directly to how many larvae I can support through a, a biomass limitation, okay? And so that restricts basically the density of larvae that I will have. So immediately you can see some of the problems you're going to have here. How do you, you fix these parameters, the biomass limitation? There have been at most one or two surveys that have tried to measure this. That's in one location. Of course, you have a huge variability in food resources. It depends. Do you have pollen falling on your pond? You know, is it away from vegetation? So there's, there's a huge variability. And it's very difficult to set these parameters. So the, you can see immediately that with these kind of dynamical models, you're going to have quite a large uncertainty with some of these aspects. <coughs> That's right. So they're integrating forward in time. So if you imagine, uh, if this were my clouds and I had a bin resolving microphysics scheme, you know, these would be my small cloud droplets, and then you would have an integration equation that showed, you know, basic models how they grow by diffusion, and so they would move. So this is like a bin resolving microphysical scheme in clouds. It's just these are, are larvae, and the equations are, uh, in fact, a little bit simpler because it's, it will show you in a moment. So basically, uh, I'm stepping the, the time steps forward one day at a time. Now, that's actually a very good question because some of these processes, when they're getting down to five or six days, one day time step is getting on the edge 
of actually resolving these. You have a little bit of time truncation problems, and that's another issue with these, these models of the numerics. But it's difficult to go down to sub daily time steps because you don't always have the data. You know, if you have daily rainfall, you want to drive the model with that. How do you subdivide that? I have been thinking of trying to perhaps subdivide with a, a temperature dynal cycle. And there are a couple of people that say that the, the dynal cycle, because of these nonlinear models, it does have an impact. Okay. For the moment, for simplicity, it just integrates forward at one step at a time, one day at a time. And as I said, all of these relationships, so both the mortality and also the actual progression rates are temperature sensitive. Okay? But the mosquito actually has two characteristics. So you can imagine, for the mosquito, for the larvae, we just have the, the development stage. For the mosquito, we have two characteristics. So, you know, what I mean by that? Well, for me, I, we could model everybody in the room, and we could have two numbers, our height and our weight. For the mosquito, what do I care about? I want to know what the development stages of the egg, okay? And I also want to know what the development stages of the parasites inside the mosquito, if she's acquired uh, the, the disease. So, when a blood meal is taken, there's a certain probability of like transmission of the parasite if it leads to infection. Then, basically, I also model in this direction the parasite development rate. Okay, so you can imagine, you know, starting off here, you take a blood meal, so you've got the protein to develop the egg. So over time, she moves to the left. Okay, now these are actually static boxes. So I'm saying in each box, it's how many vectors per square meter have this characteristic. Okay, and then we're moving from left, so it's like a it's not a Lagrangian sense. But if she's acquired a parasite, as well as moving to the left, she'll also move down through the grid at a diagonal because the parasites are developing. When she reaches the bottom row, the colors change to brown because now she has the sporozoites there ready to infect another human, which is why this is red for danger because when the blood meal is taken here, this is when transmission to a basically a susceptible human can occur. Okay. No, it's actually a distributed model. So it's like, uh, you can run it for one point. In fact, when I run the lab classes using this model, I just demonstrate it for a single location because it's very fast to run. But you run it distributed. So each box is driven by the rainfall and the temperature. At the moment, there's no communication between those boxes, though. So you can imagine it as like lots of single cells. So I'll come back to that at the end because the, the, the biggest key connectivity is not the vector movement, it's our movement. And we move around more and more and more. Anna? Exactly. Very good. So the whole reason I want to model these two characteristics are these are the two characteristics that are temperature sensitive. Okay. So she moves to the left. If it's warmer, she'll move faster, further in one day. Same with the parasites. If it's very cold, we'll just very slowly move down. Each day we'll only move down, you know, maybe just a fraction will move down one box. Okay. So these are temperature sensitive. And so the mosquitoes will keep cycling, as I said, because they lay the eggs, and then they basically go off the left, these blue arrows, and back onto the right, and take another blood meal. Eggs develop, lay the eggs, another blood meal. And this keeps going until, of course, eventually, a mortality event occurs. And that mortality is a function of temperature. The bottom row here is basically, if there's transmission, this is my human array. Okay. So these are my susceptibles. These are people without the disease. If they acquire the disease, then they start to move to the left. This is basically the development occurring inside the host until they reach here when the person is basically dangerous because they can transmit to a, a vector and they may have manifestations, clinical manifestations. Okay. So essentially, I've got an array of boxes there. They are not, that's the only part of the model that's not climate sensitive because, of course, we're warm blooded. Okay. But uh, I have an array of boxes, nevertheless, because I want to get that 18, 20-day delay, okay, in order to get that spin-up right. Okay. So you can imagine this is basically like one of these SEI models. I don't have R at the moment, because I was trying to think of the best way to in, in, put in the immunity. Immunity, as I said, is not that well understood. Uh, I think I'm going to put a simple immunity, there'll be an R box at the end. I'm just going to do it very simplistically. So the next version, actually, which will be released early in the next year, will have uh, immunity as well. At the moment, there's no immunity in the model. Okay. I'm running a little late, so I'll go very quickly just through these. I'm not going to go these. Oh, 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 the main message is these relationships are very simple to a great extent. So, for example, the uh, development 
uh, rates are, are, are often just, it's just a degree day effect. So you have a critical temperature, and you basically have, if you're two degrees above this temperature, then the process takes half as long. If you're four degrees, a quarter as long, compared to being one degree above that temperature. So the relationships are quite simple, but the parameters, like the K, can vary greatly. And there are very few field studies that allow you to set these parameters. Okay. I've tried to set the model up as simply as possible to be able to change all these. Everything's in a kind of a, a name list. So, and the idea about that is I want to make it as simple as possible to be able to explore parameter space with the model and set it up for large ensembles. So this illustrates some of this uncertainty. This is temperature on the x-axis, and this is the survivability. And all of these different lines and dots are all different parameterizations and measurements of the mortality rate as a function of temperature. Now, even if you look in the middle of the graph and you say, well, this is not a great difference, but if you actually integrate that up, this is the daily mortality rate. So if you look at the expected lifespan, the difference between 95 and 90% is huge when you integrate it forward in time. Okay. I'm going to skip over the hydrology fairly quickly just to show you. It's just a very simple, you have a, a, a catchment fraction that you have to set, which we're now trying to set according to the slope and the topography. We don't even account for the soil texture at the moment. Okay, so it's an extremely simple scheme. Uh, it's integrated forward in time. We have tried to validate it both with in situ measurements in Ghana. There's a, there's a paper in press now, and another paper that actually compares it to explicit simulations. When I say explicit, this is an extremely complicated model at 10 meter horizontal resolution for a whole village in Niger. And it's basically all of the overland flow, subflow, and everything. And so the, the lines here are just showing our simple model where we've calibrated one parameter to get the overall magnitude. It doesn't affect the sub-seasonal. So the sub-seasonal variability is the same. But the, the absolute magnitude, to get the fraction right, we had to calibrate one parameter within like a 30% range. Okay? But it's just showing one is a massively complicated 10-meter explicit simulation, and the other is just my pond fraction parameterization with that, you know, one simple equation is actually slightly different to this now. Uh, this is the, the, the 1.2.6 version. We, we, we made some small improvements. Just showing how, this is two seasons, two rainy seasons, how you can capture a lot of the variability in a very simple model with just one parameter, actually. I was, I was actually amazed at how well the, the, the simple parameterization did. I was really surprised. And this just was swapping out the, the, the station data for satellite. Okay. The biting, okay, very quickly. Um, remember I told you that the probability of actually when you get a bite is not 100%, it's only 20%. Okay, why is that important? Well, the thing is, you have distributions of bites. Even if we were all equally attractive to mosquitoes, which we are not, because some of us in this room are more attractive for various variety of reasons, uh, which are not all fully understood. Okay, one of them is just body size, so I'm at a slight disadvantage because I'm taller. Okay, I've got more skin. <laughs> but um, I give off perhaps a little bit more CO2. But even if we were all equally attractive, if there were one mosquito in the room per person, we wouldn't all receive one bite. Okay, just through random fluctuations. You know, maybe Andy would get three bites and I would escape just, just through random fluctuations. So the, mod the model just starts off with that very first simple assumption. We just simply assume that the biting process is random. So it's under-dispersive compared to reality. And so the distributions of bites per person is basically Poisson distributed. Okay. Now that's important, of course, because that affects the mean transmission. You know, if, if Andy and I get one bite each, and the probability of transmission is half, so I get there's a probability of half that I get the disease, and he's at half. So in average, one of us would get the disease. If I get both bites, and he escapes, then my probability of getting the disease is basically 0.75, because it's half, the first time, half the second time. And his is zero, so it's 0.75 instead of one. So you see that basically affects the mean transmission, because it's one of the, 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 the non-linearities in the transmission. So this shows you the, the climate sensitivity of the model. This is temperature on this axis. And you can see this is an older version of the model uh, to now. So now actually it's reduced here due to flushing, and uh, we have increased transmission here. But it's showing, again, the transmission peaks in this sweet spot of around 
25 to 32 degrees. And this just shows how the transmission, again, is a function of uh, population density. I'm going to skip over that. I'll skip over this as well. So what I want to do now is, uh, this is just a, a comparison to map. But um, what I want to show you uh, quickly is some of the uses uh, that we've applied the model to. And I just want to show you one example, because that's relevant here at the S2S timescale, sort of actually prediction. So we've, we've applied the model so far to try and look at seasonal forecasting, which I'm going to tell you about next. But we've also done a few other things that uh, I just want to list here in case you're interested. So we've looked at trying to simulate transmission in Uganda in the early 1920s and 30s, so in the pre-intervention periods, to try and see if climate could explain the variation there. Um, we've looked at climate change problems, land use change impact on malaria uh, over longer time scales. Okay. And we're also working now with, uh, quite closely with IRI on uh, aspects of basically the uncertainty in these models. Okay, with Madeline Thompson. So <clears throat> again, this is just to go into that finance again, we, I, I gave you a figure before. This shows you how, as a function of time, domestic and international funding increased, but it's essentially flattened out. Okay, again, to justify why do we want to use climate? Funding is basically plateaued, okay? And there was even a, a funding round with the Global Fund that was uh, actually cancelled due to pledges of money not actually arriving in time to disperse those funds. The first ramp up, in some ways, is easier. If you want to say, okay, nobody's got a net, you can just do a mass distribution, and you know those nets are going to be distributed. Everybody needs to have a net, okay? There's a lot of questions and discourse at the moment how we actually then maintain that coverage. You know, do you try and target? How do you know who, who needs to have their net replaced? Where your most vulnerable populations are? It's much more difficult. You don't want to just do a blanket dispersal because maybe a lot of those nets won't be required. You're wasting a lot of money. Climate information, therefore, you may be able to have cost-effective prioritization of where you target some of those intervention processes that we were talking about advising people to retreat their nets because you expect this year to be an epidemic season, for example. Sending out spray teams earlier if your rain onset is going to occur earlier. So what we try to do is we try to look at the, the potential to set up a seasonal forecasting system. So this has been tried already with the Liverpool model to a certain extent. Uh, one of the things they didn't do, uh, which we tried to do here, is their initialization of the malaria model was done in a way they basically started, a little bit like climate models are started, from a, an arbitrary state, and then they basically spin up the model with the early stage forecast situation. The problem with that is you don't have any information about what's gone on before. If I want to start a forecast today, if it's been raining more than usual my past month, I'll have more breeding sites, a higher vector density, perhaps a higher par parasite ratio. So, because it's quite a slow evolving system, the information that's occurred before my start date is really important. So what we try to do is, the point is, none of these surveys are available real time. So we had to basically try and set up an analysis which was climate driven. So we used climate observations or the reanalysis to drive the malaria model up to the start date to ensure that we have reasonable initial conditions. I say reasonable because it's very difficult to actually validate if these are correct or not. There's no real-time inf information about vector densities. And then we basically use climate weather forecast and climate forecast to drive the vector model to give us our forecast of hazard. We actually use a combination of systems. So what you've been using this week when you access S2S is this monthly EPS. Okay, So we use that as well. We use that in the first month Okay, this was, at, first of all, using out of 32 days. We can now extend that to 48 days with the new system. And then we basically slot in the seasonal forecast from month two onwards up to month four. Okay. So we're using the model system that you've been analyzing these two weeks in the, in the workshop. So we're using all 51 members of the real time. So each one of those drives a vectory model and so on. So we mask, we want to focus on areas with high variability. I'm not going to go into details here, but we're looking at how the variability, like PDF, to try and separate endemic and epidemic areas. So this is like a mask uh, of, a mask has been applied here, okay? 
And then what we've done is we've looked at the statistical skills. So I'm only showing the areas where we have high interannual variability, not the endemic areas. So all the gray areas, it's not because the forecast is not skillful or it's not raining then. It's simply that there's not strong climate-driven variability according to our assessment. So what I show here is like an RGB plot. The red means we have skill at this lead time in temperature. Blue is rainfall and the green is for malaria. So if you look, for example, on the map and you see white dots, it means that we have skill in temperature, rainfall, and also malaria. Okay, predictions. And this is validating against the reanalysis driven run. So it's assuming the malaria model is perfect at this stage. Okay. So it's just a test of how the predictability, should we say, in rainfall and temperature would translate into temperature, whether the model's acting as a, a nonlinear operator. So you can see that we have lots of yellow points, but even at lead one, a lot of the points are uh, not just, sorry, white, but they're yellow. Okay. So yellow means predictability in temperature and in malaria, but not in rainfall. So you can see even at lead one, and some of you have probably seen this already with the uh, with the, the S2S systems, that the temperature predictability extends out to a month or more, but the rainfall drops off much more quickly. So this is one month. This is one, well, this is actually, to be strictly accurate, this is, you call this a two-week lead, because it's really the first month of the integration, is that those first 32 days, 32 days. So it's going from lead zero to lead 32 in, in days. So the average lead is two weeks. So that is subseasonal. So this is your subseasonal predictability. The nice thing is you don't have any black spots. Black spots would be no rainfall, no temperature, and no uh, malaria predictability. I should put a thing on the key there. Now what this is showing is month one, month two, month three, month four lead. Okay, for I'm just showing January to June. Okay, so you can see the progression towards the colours towards. A lot of the areas have in the black spots, which means we have no more predictability four months ahead. Okay. Now, what do you notice about this? In the first month, we have lots of yellows. In month two and month three, we have lots of points which are green. Now, green means we have predictability in malaria, is skillful in malaria, but not in the climate parameters. Now, how can that happen? How can we have a two-month lead, how can we have predictability in malaria but not in climate? If we don't have any, if the temperature and the rainfall are incorrect, how can we have the malaria correct? So one might be um, if the rainfall would occur or the climate would occur in the previous month and the lag. So malaria in month two doesn't depend on the weather in month two. It depends on the weather in month two. Or it might just be an initial condition thing. You, you've got observations that of, of Death of malaria population, and that provides some exactly. Without any or kind of exactly. So it's basically, as I said, the system is slow to evolve. So you've got a lot of memory in it, and you have the lag. So it's all it's all down to those two reasons, especially the lag. Remember, we have that lag of one two months. So essentially, even if you didn't use the forecast system at all, and you only observed basically temperature and precipitation, you can still skillfully forecast malaria transmission one to two months ahead. But by adding in the EPS and the seasonal forecast, we're getting out to about month two to month three. Okay. So this also indicates that our EPS, our S2S system, is adding skill, but we're not really getting a lot from the seasonal forecast. So the seasonal forecast is like keeping it running, but we could have just uh, persisted the final temperatures or rainfall. So there's not, we're not getting a lot out of the system four. Otherwise, we'd expect to get some. There are a few points, especially in Eastern Africa, where you know, teleconnections with ENSO, for example, tend to be a bit stronger here and, and, uh, and so on. So, so when, uh, much in the, in the month two is coming from the EPS in month one versus just the, uh, just the lag in the malaria. So basically, all of this pretty much is coming from the initial conditions. So this shows you how important the analysis system is that we've put in, okay, which hasn't been done before. This is partly from the initial conditions, but partly from uh, the S2S. And we, we could, in fact, that's a test that we should do. We could actually take out, what we could do is actually, what, what I've, I've, I've set up, because you don't want to just average. So what I've often been doing is experiments where I shuffle the years in the wrong order. 
So you have the right subseasonal characteristics of the rainfall, but they're in the wrong year, so it can't possibly give you skill. And that way we could actually test this. I've already got the scripts to do that, actually, so that's a good test. Thank you very much. Okay, very quickly, because I'm running out of time in my last five minutes before the hour's up, um, I wanted to just show you very quickly some initial, and this has been slowly evolving. I was hoping this would be written up and going into the pilot stage by now, but hopefully next year. Um, fingers crossed for some DFID funding um, for next year. But essentially, we've been trying to analyze the, the system in various countries. We've looked in Malawi, under Kwesi, Rwanda, and Uganda. And I'm going to show you the Uganda because that's the, the place where we got the furthest, mainly through the fact that we have the best working relationship with the Ministry of Health there. It's very important to have these strong interactions. The other thing that's nice about Uganda is as well as having the district level data, there are also high quality called sentinel sites where you have high quality data where every single suspected case is tested, either through a microscope test or the rapid diagnostic text kit. So these are 100% confirmed. And they span from basically the highland areas in the southwest to lowland endemic areas. Okay. What you'll notice is, and this is one of the key problems, is that the time series of the health data tends to be very short. So most countries in Africa moved towards digital databases in the early 2000s. Okay. A lot of the paper records before either haven't been digitalized or, in the worst cases, have actually been lost or destroyed. So it really depends. Uh, it's, it varies from country to country, but there are very few countries. Botswana, for example, is one exception where they have longer-term records of uh, malaria cases. And they, even then, to the external research community, they're only available on a country level. And the Sentinel sites is even worse. They started in 2006 or 2009. But just to give you an idea, this is like in a comparison to the Sentinel site, and we're just showing normalized anomalies of the log of the EIR, which, as I said, relates to cases. And then we have basically the, uh, the red is the confirmed cases. Okay. <coughs> and you have the, the spread is indicated by the gray. So what you'll notice is that the model usually, and again, caveat of the short time series, and I'm going to show a couple of examples, it tends to get the interannual variability, but if you look closely in the details, you find that if you're looking at individual months, you know, you can be quite a long way off. But you find that, uh, for example, there was an ENSO year in 2010, and this is lead one, lead two, lead three, and lead four, you get the variability. So what I want to show is just how we're doing. So if you go to Kanungu, Kanungu's interesting uh, in that we actually have this double peak, and you can see the forecast system picks up that double peak at the, at the at the Sentinel site, as you go to higher lead times, you can see that timing tends to be off, okay? But it picks up this double peak, so this is not uh, ENSO driven. Okay, so this is Mubendi. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip over some of these. And you can see like Tororo only has a single peak, it's picked up, but there, there's, there's some problems with the, the timing. If you look at the, the skill, for five of the six sentinel sites, you basically have, um, should we say, the, the skill out to four months in advance, okay? The exception is Kabali, which is too cold. The model doesn't simulate, uh, it's like 17 degrees there on average. There's no malaria simulated there, but you have cases. So that's quite interesting. That can be, if you think about it, normally I would ask you why that would be, but I'm, I'm just about out of time, so I'm gonna have to do, just tell you. I mean, if you think about it, if you have a single station, you have undulating topography, so that station might measure 17, but you only have to move somewhere where you're a little bit lower down within the catchment area, and you can have higher temperatures very easily, 18, 19, where transmission can be sustained. Kabali is also on an increasingly busy trade route between Uganda and Rwanda, so there's a lot of traffic passing through, people passing from low, uh, high transmission areas through the area, often staying overnight in the area. They can then basically carry the parasite with them. You can have secondary transmission. Okay that way. But nevertheless, I mean, in, in my opinion, to my best knowledge, this is the first ever demonstration of a skillful malaria system that's been tested on a sub-national scale, okay, in this way. If you look at the non-smooth, those were smooth, this is how the raw monthly figures look like. So you can still see that double peak, for example, showing up, but if you look at the month-by-month -month figures, so we really need to think about how we're going to portray these forecasts. That was the Sentinel data. When you start to look at the district data, 
you know, things can get quite different. You have, like, this is just two districts I've picked out where you're looking at this in a longer time series. It can look very good, the forecast, in some districts, okay? But it can also bear no resemblance at all to what's actually going on, okay? So, of course, some of that is model error, but some of that, I think, is basically data inaccuracies. You really see you can have two small districts side by side, very, very disparate uh, changes. Some of that can be the actual situation, lay of the land, interventions, and so on, but it can also be data anomalies. So if you look at a map, this is a kind of a, a typical, should we say, you know, the colored districts are the ones where we're getting significant skill, but there are quite a few districts which are white, and we're not. What I was surprised about here, actually, was we actually got significant skill, even in endemic areas, where we didn't expect to have so much climate-driven variability. So where are we? I'm going to wrap up, because I've, I've overrun a little bit. But um, basically, we have this pilot system. We've tested it out on a, on a sub-national scale in, in three countries, uh, in Uganda, Rwanda, and Malawi. In Malawi, we didn't have any skill at all. And I think the forecasts there anyway, if you look at the weather forecasts, they tend to have lower skill in terms of the temperature and rainfall. That could be part of it. Um, in Rwanda, the system was doing actually very well, especially in the, the eastern end of the country. In Uganda, we can see that against the Sentinel data, it's looking pretty good, although the timing's off. We've still got to do a lot more, more work, as I said. So I'm hoping next year, especially if we manage to get a little bit of DFID funding for this, to actually take this a step further and start to look at policy in the country and how you would integrate it. So there are lots of open questions. I don't have time to like, discuss this. We've been looking at ways of trying to turn this into like upper terse and upper 10 percentile and have a, a look. We, we talked about this last week with the other, which we say the applications um, early on in the week with the flooding. And, you know, how are these products made? Uh, Frederick was saying they kind of made a product, but there's a kind of interactive process of assessing it. So, uh, we tried out on the ECNWF site for a while. There was a pilot system looking at tersile maps, a little bit like you, they use for the monthly system, where you can also mask out the endemic areas. How do you bring in vulnerability assessments? I don't have time to talk about that, but there's a whole array of, like, how do you help people to perhaps actually target their interventions? I'm of the opinion that you can't do too much because the experts and the people, the district health officers are on the ground. They know one village might be near a breeding site, lower-lying area. They tend to have higher transmission when there's transmission compared to another area. They they probably have a very good idea already within their districts how to apply a broader scale information. A lot of people say, well, you know, you, you can't use a forecast system like this because I know that malaria transmission varies from like one village to the next on scales of a kilometer. So I, I'm, I'm in two minds about how much you want to go down the route of this, trying to do this very high resolution vulnerability model, which we actually did do inside the Healthy Futures project. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Um, I wanted to show you in a nutshell the, the applications model we developed. Try and get across to you the level of uncertainty associated with some of these parameterizations in these schemes, which uh, so it's not just climate models that have uncertain parameters in them when you, you know, you're parameterizing your convection or your clouds and so on. You're often setting these parameters by one lab study that was conducted in 1962. Okay. So there's a, a massive need for data to improve our understanding of these disease uh, transmissions. Okay. We need to improve the way these things are calibrated. And remember that a model is a tool. But I think we've demonstrated so far that it's potentially a very useful tool. We just need to learn how to actually use that tool for policy. Okay, I'm going to stop there. There's some climate slides just in case anyone's interested. Thank, Thank you. you.